Hey everyone, so today we're going to be talking about inverse trigonometric functions. To start off with some motivation, say that I have the triangle with angle theta, a side 3, and a hypotenuse 5. I know that sine of theta is equal to 3 over 5, but is there a way that I can figure out what theta is just based off the given information? In other words, is it possible to solve for theta? The thing that we'll define more clearly in another slide is that the sine function actually has an inverse, and that's denoted sine inverse of x. If for a moment we take for granted that this exists, what I can do is look at sine theta equals 3 over 5, and I can take that equation and take sine inverse of both sides. By the nature of inverses, on the left-hand side, sine inverse and sine will cancel each other out and leave us with theta. Therefore, we get that theta is equal to sine inverse of 3 over 5. And this particular number comes out to 0.64 radians, or 36.67 degrees. We'll talk about how to confuse inverse trig functions of common angles on the unit circle, but when we're looking at something like 3 over 5, that's typically something that needs to be handled by a calculator. Therefore, theta equals to sine inverse of 3 over 5 is generally a preferred answer, especially if you're in a timed environment like a test. If you have a scientific or graphing calculator, it's going to have a setting of radian or degrees. Let's start being more precise on how we define things. We'll begin by drawing the cosine function. Now, first thing to notice is that this is not a one-to-one -one function, so you've got to wonder why an inverse can even be defined. So what I'm going to do is carve out this little section of the cosine function, and I'm going to only draw that. This section that I'm carving out exists between 0 and pi and goes from negative 1 to 1. A more precise way of saying that is I'm looking at a restricted domain of cosine. But this has given me something that is one-to-one. -one. So to find the inverse, visually I can draw a diagonal line and flip the function about this axis. I get this new curve, which is the representation, or rather the graphical representation, of y equals to cosine inverse of x. The most important things about this are going to be the domain and the range of this inverse trig function. The domain is the closed interval from negative 1 to 1, and the range is the closed interval from 0 to pi. This means that the angles that the inverse cosine function is going to output are angles in the first and second quadrant in reference to the unit circle. So if you only take away one thing from the slide, is that cosine inverse of x only outputs values in the first and second quadrant of the unit circle. To look at the sine inverse function, we'll do the same setup. Notice again that we do not have a one-to-one -one function, so we'll carve out this slice that sits between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. We'll flip this around that same diagonal line to get our inverse sine function. This function is going to have a domain of negative 1 to 1 and a range of negative 2 pi to positive 2 pi. Both of these intervals are closed. Now similar to y equals cosine inverse of x, we mainly care about the quadrants that this thing is going to output angles in. For us, it's going to be quadrants 1 and quadrants 4. I'll give the remaining inverse trig functions in an abbreviated way. The graph for y equals tangent invert of x looks like this. It'll have domain negative infinity to infinity. It'll have range negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2, not including those points. And this is going to output angles in the quadrants 1 and 4 of the unit circle. y equals to cotangent inverse of x has this appearance. It'll have domain from negative infinity to infinity, and it'll have an open range from 0 to pi. And this is going to output angles in the quadrants 1 and 2. The function y equals secant inverse of x has this appearance. This function will have domain negative infinity to negative 1 including union with 1 to infinity including 1. The range will be from 0 to pi over 2 union with pi over 2 to pi. And the secant inverse function will output angles in the first and second quadrant. Finally, we have y equals cosecant inverse of x, which has this appearance. Its domain will be equal to negative infinity to negative 1, union with 1 to infinity, and its range will be negative pi over 2 to 0, union with 0 to pi over 2 including. And this is going to output angles in the first and fourth quadrant. Let's jump into some examples. Let's first determine arc sine of root 2 over 2. I'm saying arc sine because that is common notation for sine inverse. Anytime you see the word arc written in front of a trig function, it's referring to the inverse of that trig function, 
with the same domain and range as everything we described before. It's just another notation, but it's also a good syntax code because this kind of thing is used a lot in programming. The first thing we'll do is set arcsine of root 2 over 2 equal to theta. This means that we need sine of theta to equal root 2 over 2. This is ultimately what we're trying to find is this particular theta. On the unit circle, this opens up two possibilities. We know that the angles pi over 4 and 3 pi over 4 evaluated at sine give me the answer of positive root 2 over 2. Remember that sine is giving us the y coordinate, so that's why I know I'm looking in the right spot. But the question is, which one of these angles is the correct answer? Since we know the range of y equals arc sine of x, we know that it's going to output angles in quadrant 1 or quadrant 4. Pi over 4 is in quadrant 1, but 3 pi over 4 is in quadrant 2. This means that we can rule out 3 pi over 4, and we can deduce that arc sine of root 2 over 2 is equal to pi over 4, and we're done. So really the game here is we identified all possible angles of the unit circle that could have given us this particular value of root 2 over 2, and then we looked at the particular quadrants that these functions output into, and then figured out which angle we had exactly. For our next example, we'll determine arctangent of negative 1. Again, this is the same thing as writing tangent inverse of negative 1. First thing we'll do is realize that we need to then find the angle theta such that tangent of theta is equal to y over x is equal to negative 1. Here the y over x is just coming from the definition of theta. So for y over x to equal negative 1, it means that y and x have to be the same number, but one of them is positive and one of them is negative. So we need to go to the unit circle and search for which ordered pairs have the same numbers in both slots, except one is positive and one is negative. We see that in the second quadrant, we have the point negative root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. And in the fourth quadrant, we have the point root 2 over 2, negative root 2 over 2. And the angles for these are 3 pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4, respectively. But since we know the range of arctangent, we know the quadrants that arctangent outputs into. And those quadrants are precisely the first and fourth quadrant. Therefore, we can rule out 3 pi over 4, and we can deduce that 7 pi over 4 is what we want. Except we're going to run into a bit of a roadblock here. 7 pi over 4 is actually not in the range of tangent inverse. Rather, 7 pi over 4 is not a number between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So how do we fix that? Well, an easy way to fix this is to convert this into a negative angle. To originally arrive at the angle 7 pi over 4, we left the x-axis and moved counterclockwise to get 7 pi over 4. But what if I left the x-axis in a clockwise manner? Mathematically, what you're going to do is take 7 pi over 4 and subtract 2 pi from it. This would give us the angle negative pi over 4. Negative pi over 4 is a number between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Therefore, we can conclude that arctangent of negative 1 has to equal to negative pi over 4. In this next example, let p be a point on the unit circle corresponding to the angle theta equals sine inverse of 2 over 3. What quadrant is this point p in? First thing to notice is that 2 over 3 is not one of the common points in our unit circle. So we need to do a little detective work here. If theta is equal to sine inverse of 2 over 3 per the problem, then sine of theta should be equal to 2 over 3. Notice that this is going to be a positive value. Specifically, it's going to be a positive y value because we're dealing with a sine function. We also know that y equaling to sine inverse of x has range negative 2 pi to positive 2 pi, so it's going to output angles in the first and fourth quadrant. But when we zoom in on the first and fourth quadrant of the unit circle and pay attention to the signs of the points, we see that in the first quadrant, the y values are positive, and in the fourth quadrant, the y values are negative. Since sine of theta is equal to a positive number, this tells us that the point corresponding to theta has to be in the first quadrant, and we're done. For our last example, we'll take care of a word problem. Say that a lighthouse stands 300 feet tall along a shoreline. A boat sees the light cast from the lighthouse. The boat is currently 5 miles from the shoreline. What is the angle of elevation from the boat to the source of the light? First thing I should do is draw a picture. I've got my lighthouse, which is 300 feet. I've got my 
distance from the boat to the lighthouse, which in terms of feet is 26,400. And I'm going to put my angle theta next to the boat because that's how the problem is raised. Looking at the information this triangle is giving us, I have a side with information opposite and adjacent to theta. This means that I should be using the inverse tangent function. So tangent of theta is going to be equal to 300 divided by 26400, which means that theta is going to be equal to tangent inverse of 300 divided by 26400. Using a calculator for this computation, we find that this is 0.651 radians or an angle of 37.3 degrees. And we're done.